Go where I tell you to go. I'm going to lead you to a, a, a new place, and I, I, I'm going to give you kids. And he makes all these promises. I'm going to make you a, a great nation. Um, but just trust me and go to leave your family, leave your home, and go to a place where I will show you. And so Abraham did. And in that act of faith, you know, that's where our, 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 the story of our relationship with, with God begins. But what's interesting is when my dad would tell that story, what was neat was... Um, he would connect himself with that story. Because when he, you know, for my dad to uproot his family at age 39, we're kind of settled in in Pennsylvania, and everything's going well, and his job was okay, and, you know, we had a house, and we had family, and we had friends, and we had a church family. To uproot his family and go to this strange place called southeastern Kentucky, that felt like a very weird thing to do. And, some, and, and a thing that I'm sure he second-guessed and third-guessed and 20-guessed and, and just many, many times wondered, is this what I'm supposed to do? And the story of Abraham doing a very, very similar thing helped him process that to know that he wasn't the first one to do something crazy and leaving a, leaving a place that you call your home to follow God on an adventure to a new place to do new things that you don't really know what's going to happen. You know, when you're the first one doing that, that, that feels a little weird, but to know that someone else has done that before you, that gave him hope, that gave him confidence, that gave him faith. We're, we are a culture shaped by stories. We just are, we're, uh, just, we are naturally shaped by stories. That's why we, oftentimes we love TV and movies so much. That's I, my favorite thing when I was in grade school was when the teacher would say, it's story time, and whip out the book, and we'd all pile in, and they'd read a story and show us the pictures. That's my favorite thing. We love stories, and those stories shape us. It's no mystery that so many um, in our kind, in the young generation want to be either like athletes or like rock star musicians. I mean, those are stories that kind of dominate our culture. Um, it's no mystery that uh, that that young ladies oftentimes will be entranced by the stories of Jane Eyre and, and uh, Withering Heights and whatever else the Bronte sisters wrote, or or uh, my sister. Every time it was uh, um, every time she was sick or we were home on Christmas break, she bust out Anne of Green Gables and watched that um, wow. because because girls are shaped by the stories of romance and follow, finding your one true love, and that that shapes the way we think. Um, if you ask a young kid what they want to be when they grow up, not all the time, but there, there will be times when they'll, they'll say what one of their parents do. Because that's the stories that shape them. That's what they see. Now, obviously, oftentimes, they kind of expand out of that. But, um, but it's, we are a culture. We are a people shaped by stories. What about the stories of God? How do they shape us? How do they, how do they form us and make us into who we're supposed to be? If you have your Bibles, anybody have the Bibles? Oh, hurt me. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to be looking at a verse in Romans 12, Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you have a Bible, all two of you, open up to Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I'm going to kind of give you the book of Romans in like three minutes, okay? That's the goal. All right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty intense. There's not much there. It's, it's pretty good. So anyway, um, the book of Romans, it's, it's like, so anyway, but let me, let me read this to you. I'm going to start right in, in chapter 1. We're going to end up in, in, in chapter 12, but I'm just going to take you a real quick tour of Romans. And this is what Paul says right at the start of it. He says, Paul, servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So he's introducing what he's going to talk about and he's saying I'm going to talk about the gospel about Jesus Christ. But what he says is that gospel is something that the prophets have talked about for years. They've been talking about this. Okay? And he says, in fact, Jesus, he's a descendant of David. Okay? So he's assuming, these people he's talking to, they're going to have some understanding of the prophets. He's assuming they're going to have some understanding of David, of King David. 
And then Jesus is going to fill in some of the gaps for that. And then, so that's his introduction. And then he starts into the book of Romans. And, uh, and as you make your way through the book of Romans, he starts pulling back on some, he starts going back and pulling out some of those stories from their past. It, right in chapter 1, um, at one point he says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So he refers to when God created the heavens and the earth, and he assumes that they know something about that. He assumes that that story has shaped them. Um, if you go over to chapter 3, when he's talking about what Jesus did on the cross, he uses the term, he said, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. And that's a special word that actually oftentimes they don't know how to translate. But it's a word that refers back to the sacrifice of the... <coughs> Hey, everybody do this with me. Reach in, grab your phone, put it on silent. Yes, that's what I do. Of course, every once in a while I forget. But there we go, there we go. All right. Okay. Where was I? What was I talking about? I can't. All right. You go. Very good. That, that sacrifice of atonement, when he says that, when he says that, he has, he's assuming that they know something about the fact that back, way back when Moses gave them the law, he told them, he gave them prescriptions for the way they were supposed to do sacrifices, and there was a special sacrifice called the sacrifice of atonement. He assumes they know something about that. When he talks about that this is what Jesus is to them. He assumes that they know that story. And then if you go into chapter 4, if you look in chapter 4, it's all about Abraham. And that story that I just told. And, and he refers to the story of Abraham and how Abraham is an example of faith. And in that same chapter, he refers to David. And he talks about how David is an example of faith. And he's assuming that his, that his readers know something about them. If you go into chapter 5, he refers to Adam. The story of Adam and Eve. And he assumes they know something about that story. If you go into chapter 7... He refers to the law, and it's all about the law, and he's assuming they understand something about that, about the story of Moses and Moses giving the law. And then if you get on over to chapters 9, 10, and 11, he actually quotes scripture after scripture from the prophets to try to paint for them a picture of where God, the, kind of the direction that God is moving with his people, the people of God as a whole and the Jewish people specifically. And he refers to scripture after scripture to try to help them understand that. And so what he does is, throughout those chapters, he pulls story after story and refers to scripture after scripture from the Old Testament to try to put together a picture of who Jesus is and who he intends for them to be. And then, kind of with that whole kind of scope, that whole story, that whole plan of salvation in, in their minds, when he gets to chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says this, he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, when you hear the word therefore in scripture, sometimes it's a little bitty therefore. It just means kind of therefore. Um, but sometimes Paul particularly will put that in key spots when there's this major transition in what he's trying to say. And this is one of those big therefores. And basically what he's saying, when the word therefore kind of means because of everything that I've been saying. You know, sometimes it just means because of what I just said. But if it's a big therefore, it's because of everything I've just been saying. This is what should be true of you. And what he's saying is because of everything I've just been saying for the last 11 chapters about God's uh, the gospel of Jesus and God's plan of salvation for us and how he's been trying to give us pictures of that since the beginning of time. With all of that in mind, he says, because of that, you need to do some things. You need to wholly dedicate yourself to God. And he says, and the way you do that is don't be, tr don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but 